Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to be with us on this webinar here today. Our webinar is being brought to you by UC Irvine Division of Continuing Education, and today's topic is about our Regulatory Affairs Program, Regulatory Affairs and Compliance Program. Before we get going, I just want to let you know how the webinar works. We have the audio lines on mute, so to ask questions, and please ask questions along the way. This is really how you get more value out of uh, this time that we have. Uh, use the Q&A section, and that is in, let me point at it here for you. There is my pen tool, pencil. So it should be right about there somewhere on your website, on your um, browser. Uh, if not, go up to the top right, and you will see a chat or a Q&A button all the way up on the top right in your uh, top menu bar. Click on one of those and type the questions in. Today we'll be covering uh, a, a bit about really the background in um, why somebody might want to uh, really pursue a, a career in these areas because those are always the first thing you want to think about is, you know, are there enough jobs available out there for everybody and is, is it going to be something that's worth your investment to, um, to make sure that, um, you know, you put all this time and effort into it and you've got jobs out there. So we want to talk a little bit about that. We also want to talk about, uh, you know, again, the general employment. But we'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the programs and also with our panelists, we'll give you a little sense of what it's like to work out there because that's another thing that's very important when you're considering moving into a field. You want to get a sense of, you know, what is it like in this industry? You know, you don't want to get two or three years into your career and figure out, you know, I don't really like this style of the people, what they do, the processes, uh, and that's important. So we've got a couple great panelists on board with us here today that will help us answer those questions. Well, my name is Dave Demas, and I'm the Director of Engineering and Science Programs here, Life Science Programs here <coughs> at the University. Excuse me. I'm also on the faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. <clears throat> We've also got with us Jennifer Mortensen, who is our program manager in this area. Now, one of the things we want to uh, encourage you guys to do is if you've got any questions at all <clears throat> along the way, excuse me, uh, if you've got any questions at all, utilize us, especially Jennifer. She spends a lot of time talking to students in a variety of different backgrounds. Some of those students may be returning veterans. Some of them are people that are out of a job and are scared. Uh, some of them are students <clears throat> just graduated. And all of those students, Jennifer is very, very good. She's heard a lot of stories and helped those students move through their careers and take the next steps and also counsel them in the meantime. So please feel free to uh, talk to us. Well, we're very fortunate to have two other uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists on with us today. And my apologies, I just got some little bit of lunch <clears throat> and I think I've cleared it out. There we go. Uh, so we are really fortunate to have Dr. Al Rigo with us here today. Al is uh, one of the founders of this program. He's also spent a lot of time in industry as a consultant and has a deep background in in this area, in this area of regulatory sciences, regulatory issues, compliance, which, as we'll talk about, are a little different. You can see a lot of the details of his background up in the text. Uh, and again, he's done this for uh, local companies here in Orange County. And, um, you know, again, we are located <clears throat> south of Los Angeles in Orange County. A pretty big, strong hotbed of jobs here. And that's where Al's located. Uh, we're also fortunate to have Sarah, Sarah LaCour with us today. And Sarah has is, is been a great story as well. She uh, actually went through our program after getting her degree in biology at Xavier and uh, is really kind of a typical story 
of figuring out, you know, all right, well, I've got an undergraduate degree. Uh, it's fairly general. Uh, it is science-oriented. What do I do then? What is my path, and how do I get to these jobs? So in a couple of minutes, we're going to have uh, Sarah and, and Al talk to you about how they um, went through their paths to take the steps they, they took to get the jobs that they are now um, now in. And it's, it's good to, to hear what those steps are like. But you can also see, again, what, what Sarah did is Sarah went through our program here and then went on to, to the Keck Graduate Institute, which is a very uh, illustrious uh, school here in Southern California, uh, part of the Claremont Colleges, and uh, a very, very good school to get her master's degree, uh, which is really those two steps has helped form the basis of her career. So welcome, Sarah, and welcome, Al. We're going to go on just real quickly and talk about some of the things that we have available here at the university. What we do at the university is we look around at the employers and we ask them, are your uh, potential employees, do they really have the skills necessary to do the jobs that you need to have done? And if not, sometimes we'll get together with some faculty, some other people within industry, and build out a program. Well, many years ago, we realized that people coming out of school were just not, just didn't have the skills that industry needed in these areas. So we put together a short practical program in regulatory affairs and compliance. And you can go on our website and see some of the details of all of the stuff on the page here, the benefits, the kind of people that typically attend, and a little bit of an overview of the program. But that's really the key is we only do this you know, we are, we are a nonprofit organization here, so we, we only do this when it's valuable to the workforce and the employers. And that's part of the mission of the University of California is to be sure that not only do we do great research and not only do we train undergraduates and graduate students, but we're also here to make sure that the workforce in the United States and especially in California has got the skills necessary to fulfill the jobs that employers need to have filled. And that's why we build these little programs. But the next thing that we always look at, and I'm going to ask um, you know, Sarah and Al about this in a minute, the next thing we always look at is, uh, well, before we even offer a program or before you guys even consider um, making a change in your careers, you always want to look at, well, what does the market look like uh, in the future for people that hold these kinds of careers uh, and these kinds of backgrounds? And if you see here, what Jennifer pulled out was from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, uh, and it's showing that these kinds of people are going to grow, um, you know, between 18, maybe 17 percent, depending on what category you specifically choose, uh, between now and 2024. And that's that's a very strong growth rate. Uh, a lot of jobs have zero growth rate, maybe even a little negative growth rate. But to have a, a high double-digit number like that, a 17 or 18 percent compounded growth rate, is very strong. And we'll talk. We'll ask Al and uh, and Sarah to tell us a little bit about what why they think that's happening in a minute. But uh, it, it is strong, and you see some of the areas that uh, and some of the companies that people are hiring for uh, that Jennifer listed there. Some of the big name ones that you, you probably heard the names like Johnson & Johnson and Merck, uh, uh, Pfizer, Medtronic, uh, but there's a whole bunch, in fact, a lot larger number that you have not heard of. And uh, those companies are hiring as well. And the way you find those is you go to your local library and ask them to utilize their business database and do maybe a search of 50 miles within um, from where you live, and that that will um, give you all those listings. And those are really valuable because the big companies hire a lot, but the mid-sized to small companies actually hire more people, just because there's so many more of them. But they're a little bit harder to find, so you got to do a little more homework to do that. Uh, all right, well, just I think, did you put another one? And let me make sure here if we've got a question. 
All right, I think we've got a, a question for Alan uh, uh, coming up here. There we go. So sorry, I'm going to skip back one page, and then we'll we'll come and get a, some input from from Alan, Sarah. But again, the, what we've seen is those employment opportunities. What kinds of jobs are available out there? And you can see Jennifer's got a nice list here of the kinds of titles. And again, different companies use different titles. And you've got to get used to these and, and actually research them a bit. But you know, titles that have those words in them, it could be compliance, it could be regulatory, but it could also be something like risk. Uh, you see the one title in the middle, risk specialist. Uh, you see a bunch of titles related to quality. You know, often these kinds of things, compliance is, is within a quality department within an organization. You also see a lot of project managers, uh, research coordinators, uh, other uh, managers of tasks and projects as a part of the titles of these specific areas. And again, there's a broad range of titles. And what we recommend that you do, if you're interested here, Again, you go look for your local companies, the big ones, the mid midsize, and go onto their websites and see the jobs that they have open, and read the job descriptions, and see if, if first if those you know match anything that you have, and if it doesn't, then maybe you come back, take a couple classes, get a little bit of experience. Um, but either way, it gives you some really good um, direction. On, on, first of all, what these companies are hiring for, what the titles are like, how they use different titles, and then what you might need to embellish your resume in order to get some of these. So now we will ask Al and Sarah to pipe in a little bit. Um, and I'm going to take you both off. There we go. We should both be able to talk. So, uh, Sarah, I'm going to start with you. Just give us your thoughts on your, you know, What's important as far as background and personality to be to be successful and happy in in regulatory and compliance? Um, hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, you're fine. Okay, well, um, I think one of the major factors in being successful in uh, the field of clinical research and you know specifically regulatory affairs is to have the goal of uh, collaborating with other healthcare professionals um, uh, in a team-oriented environment with the end goal of providing uh, medical treatment, whether that be a drug form or um, uh, in a medical device form, uh, to help benefit a patient. I think keeping uh, the patient as and, and their safety as the end result at your forefront uh, will help make you a great team player and help your job be very rewarding. Um, as far as getting into the industry, uh, like you know, Dave mentioned, there are uh, several other pathways that may not have that specific title as regulatory affairs specialist. Um, uh, you know, to add to that list, uh, you know, you can also look into a safety role. Um, but reading those job descriptions is key. Um, because they will have uh, some regulatory uh, descriptions in there if you can't just get a job straight into the uh, field of regulatory because there it is sometimes difficult, and especially with these larger companies. They do want you to have that, that experience. Um, but as they've mentioned, with going the smaller company route, that is actually how I was able to get my start um, as well because um, going into a small company, you get the opportunity to wear many different hats um, in this field of clinical research. Uh, so there is a lot of cross-collaboration that happens where you get to work, uh, you know, side by side with people from all of these different departments within that company. Um, uh, something that also helped me uh, break into this field was an internship. I completed an internship um, at UCI in their neurology department. Um, so that helped out, you know, tremendously with being able to add that to my resume. My the calls that I was getting uh, pretty much doubled once I was able to complete that internship, um, as well as add um, the cross functionality that I was able to uh, the experience that I was able to develop from working, uh, you know, with uh, various teams on my resume as well. Uh, so. 
I think, you know, making sure that the patient is at the forefront is, you know, key to being happy in your career, because uh, that, to me, is, you know, very self-rewarding as well. Yeah, great, great, Sarah. And I think it, it really underscores one of the things that we really try to match you guys up with is making sure, again, that what, what you're doing that you enjoy every day. Uh, Al, are you are you on? Are you, can you hear us okay? Oh, I can hear you okay. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, we're all good. So g give us, the, you know, a, uh, a, the answer from your point of view, same thing, you know, how you got in, what you think, uh, you know, makes a good uh, compliance or regulatory person. Oh, sure, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, first of all, I was basically working in the pharmaceutical and medical device fields um, in areas that were scientific, if you will, and outside of the realm of regulatory and quality. Uh, but it became pretty apparent to me that uh, in order to kind of grow my career, that uh, there was a real opportunity from a regulatory and quality perspective. And that's simply because there is a huge demand for that uh, compared to, let's say, scientists in general. Now, remember, this was several years ago. Um, but still, what we're finding is looking at two things. First of all, most companies that were small, and I'd say about 50% of the medical device companies specifically uh, in the United States exist in Southern California. Uh, they were small, they did not have the resources to deal with having a regulatory affairs function. However, something has really changed over time. And over the years, what's happened is that the regulations and the requirements from the Food and Drug Administration have gotten much more strict with time. The second thing that has occurred is that we've become much more global in the sense that we're not dealing with just the US FDA, we're usually dealing with the European Union and Japan and Canada internationally. So there is all of a sudden a huge growth because of increased regulations and increased internationalization, if you will, for the need for regulatory affairs. Now, it used to be, and this, I'm trying to put some perspective on this for you, it used to be in the old days that the the regulatory affairs department was sort of looked at sort of like the salesman in a professional field, a car salesman. Uh, they're not very important, whatever, whatever, whatever. As it turns out with time that because of the increased regulations and the interactions with all of these regulatory bodies, uh, they have become exceedingly important. So the opportunities in the regulatory affairs area really has grown tremendously, and I don't see an end in sight for that at all. So from the standpoint of opportunity, I think that uh, this is the right place to be at the right time. Now, I will also say that uh, a lot of companies that uh, had to deal with, let's say, relatively loose regulatory affairs requirements or regulations uh, in the past, uh, therefore did not uh, put personnel in place to deal with regulatory affairs and the ongoing increase, if you will, of the regulations and international requirements. Um, and now I think they're playing a serious catch-up game now. And so the regulatory affairs personnel are really in pretty high demand, which means that they can start to command some pretty good salaries, if you will. and. Uh, now you're looking at regulatory affairs and quality assurance, but regulatory affairs specifically as now not just a side item, but in fact very heavily involved in the entire aspect of design control, regulatory aspects that would require uh, putting together the right submission packages, working with R&D from concept of a product all the way to the very end where it actually goes out the door as a sold and distributed product. So. This leads me to just one other thing I wanted to say is that the skill set for somebody in regulatory has to be team player, team player, team player. And that does not mean just internally with personnel within a company, but it also has to be a team player when you're interacting with a variety of different uh, government uh, or a notified body and or uh, uh, I, I guess competent authorities throughout the world because they are your customer just like the customer uh, that purchases the product and you got to satisfy both customers. So you have to be a team player. You have to 
make sure that you're working well within as well as outside of the company for all of the items that I mentioned. And the one thing that is more important than virtually anything else is that you must be honest and maintain your integrity because in this area, if you have a good reputation, everything will fall into place for you. But if you don't have a good reputation or if you compromise your reputation, then that could be essentially you're messing, you're messing yourself up and you're going to lose opportunities in terms of a career path and career growth. So that's that's all I have to say at this point. A long answer, but I just wanted to get all that in. Oh, that's great, Alan. I think it reflects what we hear a lot and what we see. And honestly, when I hire myself, uh, you know, things like uh, people's ability to get along with people, uh, you know, their, their honesty are absolutely key, far above things like GPA or anything. I learned a long time ago not to not to hire on GPA, but to hire on, you know, the, the, the person, the, the things that you learn in kindergarten, right? You know, get along with people, share toys, you know, be nice. And again, it's uh, it's critical, absolutely critical. Well, we want to talk a little bit, give you a little bit more of a sense of <clears throat> the kind of roles that people uh, typically follow. And we'll come back and ask Al and, and uh, Sarah these, these questions as, as well. But we wanted to give you a sense in, in, on this page of what kinds of things that uh, the regulatory professionals do. And again, it is a very broad field. Uh, there's a, a wide range of things that, that, uh, that you can do, again, from the compliance-related things uh, to the reg regulatory. Um, and again, a lot of it, um, like Al said, you know, you're interacting with agencies, uh, with the big regulatory agencies, um, FDA in the U.S. and, and uh, other agencies outside the U.S., and you're kind of that, that, that middle person moving things around. Uh, and again, your, your focus is on, you know, uh, your could, focus could be on the compliance side, you know. You know, as the product is being, or drug is being created, and you've already got it in market, uh, you've got to maintain your, your processes to, to just the tiniest little level. You change any one little thing in your process, and if you don't document it or you don't get it approved, you know, they can shut you down. So it is a very scary thing to a, a large organization to to have their product line shut down or, or, or not. I mean, shut down is a little draconian, but um, it, it could. It, these kinds of things can happen if you just aren't meticulous in the way you, you follow process on any other, any change uh, once the product is already in the market. Then there's all of the front end stuff of, of getting the product to market and getting it approved and getting the clinical trials. Uh, and there are just, just hundreds of different levels and different types of roles within both of those major categories. Uh, and again, depending on your interests and your background, but the best way to, to do this, as Sarah mentioned, it is to, to go out and, and, and get some internships. And we actually, we have an internship program, a course here, uh, that is incredibly valuable to, for both things. As Sarah mentioned, it gets you something on your resume that says, hey, this person actually has done and worked in the industry a little bit. And because we get this question all the time is, hey, I, I've never worked in the industry and they want experience before they let anybody work in the industry. So how can I... You know, it's a chicken and egg. I mean, how can I ever get this thing broken? Well, one of the ways you get it broken is you uh, get your foot in the door through an internship course, and that does two things. It gets you that experience on your resume, but it also gives you exposure to the working environment. It gives you exposure to the variety of different things that people do and the paths that you could potentially take, as, um, as Al was mentioning, in your career along the way. So... Really good thing to do. We'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute, but just to give you a sense a little bit about the possibilities of things that are out there. The other thing we highly recommend to, to anybody that's considering these things is get out to the professional organizations. And we've listed a few of them here. Most of them have regular monthly meetings uh, live, uh, depending on where you live. If you live in the Orange County area, certainly uh, uh, we're large enough that we would have uh, monthly meetings for most of these organizations. Uh, we actually have one of our own, the Orange County Regulatory Affairs. Let me, O-C-R-A, 
if you happen to be here in Orange County, California, that's Orange County Regulatory Affairs, but there are regulatory affairs organizations like that for a lot of the major hubs where the hiring's going on. SoCal Bio was another Southern California one. Uh, RAPS is this guy right here. This one is not. This one is local. It's not local. Uh, has local events, but it is a, a national and international uh, uh, society. But we, we just recommend that you go to these meetings. They, they may talk about a specific um, topic that night, uh, might delve deep into a particular new product that's being offered by Edwards Life Sciences or something. But the reason you're going is, yeah, to kind of plug into the industry technology, but also to meet people, to talk to them, to increase your network, and also talk to more people, especially one-on-one, -on -one, about what it's like to work in the industry. And while you're doing that, you're adding one more person that you know to your network that can help you get jobs. So really good things to do. Please go there because having a large number of people on LinkedIn or some other social media tool is nice but it's even more, much more important to have some of those people be people that you physically met and seen and talked to because only those people are really going to be able to stand up for you when you're applying for a job at their company. If somebody's never met you before but you've linked up with them on LinkedIn or Snapchat or something, they just, they're not going to know you well enough to recommend you. But even in a short meeting at a live event, kind of like a date, right? You can get a lot of feeling for wh how somebody is, who they are, in even a 10 or 15 minute conversation. So you don't have to know somebody forever for them to be able to help you in your career. But again, meeting them live is a very good thing. So get out to those industry organizations. We really, really see people move forward in their career that uh, have, have done that kind of stuff and worked that networking. And again, we got a lot of this from, from, from Sarah and Al and many of our other advisors and instructors uh, about you know, getting into the regulatory affairs uh, organizations. When you go to these meetings, uh, again, you're, you have to be the person to, to walk up to people and say, hey, you know, hey, my name is Dave, um, you know, I'm, I'm new here, uh, I'm thinking about getting into the career. Can you tell me something about how you got in? You know, be the interviewer, be the late night talk show host. Get, you know, you are interviewing them. People love to talk about themselves, but they also get to know you, and uh, you get to know again how they move through their career path. So, again, we do recommend many things. You know, push yourself a little bit, just like Sarah did. She got out there and and pushed. She found a um, a place where she could do the internship. Uh, we we did the course, we offered the course, but she found the internship in a place that she liked um, and uh, did that for 10 weeks. Actually, I don't, uh, it was uh, 60 hours total, so she, she may have spread that out um, over a few weeks or several weeks, depending on the employer's needs. But, you know, pushing yourself and getting out there is a very valuable thing. So stretching yourself, find mentors. Uh, and as Al mentioned, you know, uh, be be honorable and and relatable. Uh, those those are key assets as you're building your career, and certainly as you are working through and actually in your career, moving up in the chain of command. Well, we just want to talk a little bit about some of the things we have out here at the university. Uh, we have a, a set of courses based on our. Uh, assessment of the needs here, and by based on honestly the employers telling us what uh, their employees need, uh, or in order to be an employee, what you need. All of our courses are online, but they're real courses. They just are flexible enough where you don't have to drive down here. You could be honestly uh, like many of our students anywhere in the United States or on, outside of the United States. We have a pretty good chunk of people that usually take classes that are outside the U.S. It's all the same stuff, though. The only thing different is the, the lectures are recorded. Sometimes they might have a live interaction like we're doing right now where people can ask questions live and ha have it be synchronous. But most of it's uh, asynchronous. You will do all the same amount of work. You'll ask questions of the instructor. 
uh, the instructor's there. This is not a, uh, a self-paced class. It's a real class that you're graded for. You interact with students, other students in the class. You have projects. Uh, and so it's, it's the same amount of work as a regular class. It's just more flexible so you can fit it into everything else you've got going in your life. And we found that most people, even if they've, uh, you know, single parents with a couple kids, uh, are able to fit these things in because, you know, in that example, they might do all their homework once the kids have gone to bed for an hour or so or 15 minutes at lunch or, uh, you know, there's a lot of different times within the day that we find that people uh, actually do the work for the classes. In this particular program, what we do is we have certificates. And in the certificates, if you wanted to finish out a full certificate, uh, this particular program is 15 units. So it's a lot less units than certainly a college degree or master's or anything. It's meant to be very practical, get you the skills that you need in a short period of time, and, uh, and then let you move on if you want to, like, like again, Sarah did. So again, uh, there's a couple required courses and a couple electives. It is focused on compliance and regulatory. And we'll come back to some of the details of the courses in just a second, but uh, we want to go back and, and ask Sarah and Al both about where they see the, the industry moving, because this relates a bit to how uh, the job market is, because we've talked about that. Yes, the job market is growing, but what are the specific components of that of that growth? And we, we want to have you guys hear these answers because maybe some of those things really light you up and say, dude, I want to be a part of that. That sounds very interesting. I want to make a difference uh, in the job that I have. So, so Al, we'll start with you this time. Give us your thoughts on, you know, where things are going and, and why they're going that, that direction as far as um, changes in the field. Uh, sure. Um, I guess the primary thing is is that I mentioned earlier that the regulatory requirements are getting tighter and tighter with time, and they are increasing with time. Uh, but now you're starting to talk about the introduction of a lot of brand new techniques. For example, say risk analysis and risk assessment, where you're looking at benefit risk ratios and the like, is really something that is being introduced uh, in the pharmaceutical as well as in the medical device side of business. So risk analysis and the techniques used for risk analysis become a very important tool that is uh, incorporated, if you will, into any regulatory affairs filing and is certainly a tool where you can contribute directly into the R&D process when there is a product that is being developed. Uh, in general, you're also seeing the uh, general unification, if you will, of a variety of regulations, as in the case of the European Union. So, you know, you're looking at a population and regulatory uh, filing opportunities, technical files, uh, the development of protocols, uh, test, test reports. Uh, it's just a whole myriad of, of possibilities that come into play simply because the requirements are now out there that demand that uh, you are more technically uh, on board with meeting the regulatory requirements. Uh, along those lines, okay, there's also a lot of uh, fantastic opportunity developing in what I'm going to call the quality assurance side of the business, but that really is in terms of quality systems, uh, quality management systems, training of personnel to quality systems and to regulations. So there's the aspect of the technical, there's the aspect of the training, there's the aspect of developing your own expertise as a risk analysis type of professional or clinical information evaluation or biocompatibility data evaluation or sterilization. I, I could probably sit here for hours talking about all of the open-ended opportunities and possibilities once you're into the medical product industry and going the regulatory route, where it is the core of all other functions tying into regulatory affairs because they are in the middle of virtually all of those types of processes. So that's the way I look at it. 
Great, thanks, Al. Sarah, what, what's your thoughts on, on how things are changing and where things are going? Um, well, I, I guess to kind of piggyback off of Al's response, um, you know, a regulatory, they are at the, the, the core of it all where they are interacting with uh, uh, their vital key members that are interacting with so many other different uh, moving parts with getting these products to the market. Um, and something else to mention, you know, it, it's more to just memorizing all of these regulations, uh, especially with them getting tighter. It's also, you know, being able to know the ins and outs of this medical marketplace, um, you know, of your specific uh, therapeutic area and understanding, you know, uh, how all of these uh, changing regulations that Alan mentioned uh, will, you know, impact, uh, uh, impact the industry. Um, so I think um, keeping that in mind is it, it, vital with, you know, joint, uh, being a part of the regulatory and getting into this industry uh, in regulatory affairs. Absolutely. And a couple of other things we see in general is that uh, there's two other major big market forces that are occurring here is that uh, people are getting older. Uh, we have a demographic of uh, um, baby boomers that are moving quickly into retirement. Some of them are way past that and still working. <laughs> but uh, uh, the point is the population is getting older because we have that uh, bulge in the, in the population. Um, and, and that puts more pressure on companies, uh, but also adds market. The market is growing for people that need, um, you know, healthcare products and, and drugs. And all the big companies know that. So uh, they, they know their market's growing and they're trying to get as many cool products out there. And of course, they're, they're, they're saving lives and they're doing wonderful, great things. At the same time, <laughs> The people that are working in the industry are getting older, and they are retiring out of these positions in the industry, uh, which puts uh, puts a little bit of a vacuum in there because there's just not as many people being uh, graduated from, from colleges uh, that have the experience that these companies need. So, again, those are the, some of the things that drive the, the long-term need. Uh, for more people in this industry. So let's take a quick look, though. Let's go back to some of the courses here at the university. Uh, if you did, and somebody already had this question, uh, is, you know, do I have to sign up for the whole certificate all at once? And the answer is no. Uh, you know, we, we're here to help you however we can help you move forward in your career. We house all the courses together in a certificate just because it's easier to, to find it and for you guys to understand it and market it. Uh, but we just want you to do whatever is helpful to you. Um, many people just start by taking a single class. And that's the only commitment, one class, 10 weeks long, maybe, uh, maybe about $700 a price. And then see how it goes. See if it fits in, see if you're learning anything, seeing if you're making some more connections in your life. But this is the set of courses up here, and there are two tracks. There's a track that's right up here at the top that is pharma, and then another track down here that is device. So again, pharma is for people that might want to work for drug companies. Device is somebody that wants to work for somebody that makes a, a physical product. Um, and again, some people you know, don't know for sure which one of those they're going to do, but uh, we've kind of given a little bit of a track on both sides. So there are a few required courses. You can see them here under each one of them where you've, you've got some kind of introductory course, like the top one there on the Introductory to Regulatory Affairs. Uh, and it's the same. This class right here is the same as this class right here. This, so regardless of which track you choose, if you take that class, you could use it for either track, and it really doesn't matter. These tracks are to help you kind of understand which courses might be more valuable for you. They're just a structure. Uh, they are not anything required. Uh, they're just to help you, again, understand the structure. The courses that Jennifer has listed in yellow are those courses that will be offered in our upcoming quarter, which is winter. The University of California is on the quarter system which means we have 10-week quarters. 
we are in the middle or just finishing up our fall quarter. And then in January, we will do a 10-week winter quarter. And about April, we'll do another 10-week spring quarter, which will take us into June. And in the summertime, we will do another 10 weeks. So we have four 10-week uh, quarters at the University of California. And what you see in yellow are those courses that are going to be offered in our upcoming quarter, which is winter, winter quarter. So you can see the regulatory requirements for med devices and the uh, regulatory affairs planning and management uh, are a couple of the big ones. And then some of the very interesting ones on uh, drug safety and pharmacovigilance and medical product quality systems are two other key electives. Now you can see that the elective courses down here are the ones you choose from if you do decide to get the entire program and get the full certificate. Uh, again, you do the 10 units of uh, uh, courses up here and then five courses down here, which usually means either two or three elective courses and three or four required courses. Usually, as we've said before, most people take these courses one course per quarter uh, if they're working. Now, if you're not working, different story. You know, you could take uh, several courses uh, in a single quarter. So that's the, the course offering. The fees are typically about $700. If you did the entire program, you'd end up spending about $4,000. But again, don't think about this up front. You don't have to commit to a, you know, taking every class. Take one, see how it goes. Uh, again, the textbook fees is you know approximately 80 bucks per course for a textbook. And then we do have a little charge that we charge you when you uh, advance to candidacy if you choose to finish out the certificate. Again, there, there's no requirement to do that. And for many people, you may not need that. Maybe you've got a pretty good background and you just need a couple courses to help fill out your resume. Or like Sarah did, maybe you need to you know, get your foot in the door and actually uh, be in a laboratory. And a good way to do that is uh, by using that uh, internship course. Okay, we're going to come back to our panelists because again, they've got a lot better feel since they've actually worked in the industry. And, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sarah and Al again both these questions. So. What, uh, you know, the first question is, you know, just kind of generally, what advice would you give people that are entering the profession? And, and Sarah, let's start with you this time. Okay. Um, uh, as mentioned, you know, completing an internship for me um, was really the route that helped me out a lot. I see that uh, Michaela had asked a question in regards to uh, the background and transitioning. Um, having that background is a good thing um, in the food and regulatory to transition to medical or pharma. Um, another good aspect, um, I, I don't think it would be too difficult, um, especially if you can't get in with a, a startup company, uh, one of the smaller companies. Um, and another uh, person that you can talk to as far as uh, entering the profession are recruiters. Um, recruiters. Um, they know specifically what these employers are looking for, um, you know, because a job description, it may list, you know, they want someone with five years of experience um, or, you know, the, or more entry level, you know, two years, let's say two years of experience. However, um, talking to the recruiter, you know, based on other aspects that may be on your resume, like in Michaela's um, example here in food and regulatory, um, that may help you out in that in terms of at least getting your foot into the door and getting that interview. Um, so I think getting into the field, um, uh, you know, speaking, you know, completing these internship programs that, you know, are associated. Uh, and for me, to find the internship, it, it was a lot of uh, essentially cold calling um, and emailing, you know, various different departments. Um, and just seeing if they were willing to take on an internship. Mine was unpaid, um, and it was, you know, part-time. I did, you know, just a couple hours a week. Um, you have, as Dave mentioned, 10 weeks of completed, you know, 60 hours. Um, so I did take that full-time because – that full-time to complete it because, you know, it is difficult to be <laughs> unpaid as, you know, we have bills. But 
um, it still is a great sacrifice uh, to help me. It helped me get to where I am today. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, speaking with these recruiters, uh, they know more than anything else of exactly what the companies are looking for because sometimes it isn't, you know, checking every single bullet point that's on that job description. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And Sarah, I'm going to pull up your, your other, your, your slide you just said in just one second. Uh, Al, give, give us your thoughts about, you know, again, people entering the profession, uh, the hot trends. Sure, sure, abso absolutely. Um, I basically would echo what Sarah is saying and maybe extend that just a little bit. Um, you know, when you're taking these courses, I've had students, for instance, connect with me directly and say, do you happen to know of uh, some organization or some company that may take on uh, an intern? Uh, and once in a while, uh, yeah, it works. Uh, I know of a lot of different companies. so contacting the various lecturers or the various uh, uh, personnel within the organization that is the UCI Extension Program uh, is certainly another way of doing it. And I really think that you want to network as much as you possibly can, either through professional societies, contacting people that you know. In this business, there's more things that happen by virtue of word of mouth than by virtue of you know, some fantastic uh, resume, if you will. So it, the, the interconnect with people is just really do as much as you can to interlink with as many people as you can, but don't forget the companies. Now, you can also take into consideration that there's a lot of allied industries that are associated with this in that, for instance, there may be a medical device company, but the medical device company uh, may be using a particular supplier off of let us say sterile packaging or there could be a laboratory that supports uh, the industry or there could be a sterilization facility that supports the industry so if you think beyond just a a manufacturer and all of the allied if you will companies and uh, and the like then there's lots of additional opportunity to kind of get your foot in the door and once your foot is in the door you can't close that door anymore and that's the first real step into really being able to move forward. I think that the trend is, as I've said before uh, uh, in an earlier discussion, <coughs> excuse me, um, that there's going to be more and more demand. And one thing I wanted to emphasize that Dave said that, that, that really struck me is that regulatory and quality assurance personnel in the past have always been, if you will, on the low end of the professional totem pole way in the past. But because of that, there's very few professionals that are available, and the demand is so high now that as the older ones like myself are starting to slowly disappear, there's nobody to fill the holes. So once again, there's a huge opportunity from the standpoint of a long-term career in, 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 the, in that area. So I think everything's very positive all the way across the board. Absolutely. And that's mostly true. The, uh, and Sarah, I just, I, sorry, I somehow got the slide wrong. Uh, did you want to talk to, can you talk to this slide just for a second? Um, sure, this is just a, um, a preview slide, if you would, on some of the topics that would be covered uh, in the course that I will be teaching in the winter uh, term. As the post-approval compliance for pharmaceutical products, um, it is one of the uh, required courses if you're going the pharma route. Um, so we'll essentially just be looking at once the device is approved, or the pharma, sorry, the um, pharmaceutical product is approved, uh, what happens, you know, uh, after that is it, it, it doesn't just end there. Um, there are other things that um, do go into monitoring these, uh, these products once they have received approval. Yeah, and again, this is, is, is a nice story, by the way. So if you haven't haven't heard, figured out the story already, um, you know, Sarah uh, came through our program. Uh, she went on to uh, Keck, uh, got her a master's degree, uh, and uh, you know, moved up quite rapidly in her career. Uh, it wasn't overnight, but it was pretty darn fast. 
And uh, now she's back with us actually teaching in the program. And this is wonderful, right, because it's very common for us uh, to, to see these kinds of stories. We don't see as many as we'd like because not as many uh, of our students keep in touch, but this is just a wonderful progression. And again, you're, you're talking to somebody in the class who's, who's actually doing it, but also you're talking to somebody in the class on a regular basis for 10 weeks who's moved through the same kind of career path that many of you guys may, may want to may be considering and hoping that, that you'll be able to do as well. And that's, uh, it's a great thing to do, to have somebody like Sarah as your instructor for a while. Okay, a couple other things, that seem, there's a couple questions and I'm gonna get right back to them. Oksana and uh, Kalana, Michaela, Michaela uh, we'll get right to your question. Let me just do two other things, so real quick. Uh, if you uh, are, are in need of financial aid, uh, here's a couple options. One is if you are unemployed. And again, we do get a lot of unemployed people because they're scared, they're worried, they want to make a career change. Uh, so if you're, on that, if you're in that situation, then there are two major programs here, the Workforce Investment Act and the Trade Adjustment Act. Those are federal programs. Uh, and uh, what they will do is they will pay for a certificate. They'll pay for the entire certificate. Now, they're not gonna pay for a new college degree because college degrees are generic. The reason these, work, these uh, things were passed is to create a little bit of money for somebody to get very specific job skills that can help them immediately get a job, which is exactly what these programs are. They are designed to give you just the skills, no theory, just the skills from practicing people like Sarah and Al uh, to get jobs. So if you are in that situation, please reach out to your unemployment office. Here in the state of California, the unemployment offices are called one-stop shops. And if you don't know where to find those, just go on the California website here. We've listed it here, but just talk about the unemployment office. You do not wanna just collect your unemployment check you want to get down there, they have a lot of good resources besides getting you this money. They have a tremendous amount of resources, both psychological resources, so they can help the, can give you some advice on how to dress, just everything. And honestly, every little piece of that, that puzzle helps uh, when you're looking for a job. I've been there, uh, it's tough, uh, but they have a lot of great resources, a lot of good cheerleading, please utilize them. Trade Adjustment Act is similar. Uh, but it's for those people that lost a job uh, due to outsourcing. The other good thing about these programs, guys, is they might give you this money you know, now for next quarter, um, and you will most likely get a job pretty quickly. It might take a couple months, might take three or four months, but the organizations here, the federal government, will continue to pay for the entire certificate regardless of whether you get a job, and most people get a job before they finish the programs. The programs can take a year. So very good, very good programs. A couple other ones for people that are just coming out of school, uh, students that have the ability to uh, maybe live at home or something. AmeriCorps is really good for two reasons. One, it'll pay for the certificate, but two, it'll get you out there volunteering and interacting with the community in a way that connects you with senior executives. Because there's two groups of people that do AmeriCorps. There's young kids, uh, and then there's older uh, executives where they're, uh, I don't know, their kids are out of the house and they're grown and they want to give back. And those people are usually quite senior and in positions to really help you get jobs. So if you're out there volunteering with them for, for a little while, then, um, you know, that's a really good thing. They get to know you and they can help. Uh, if you do already have a job, we didn't mention it on this slide, but if you do already have a job, most of our people that take our courses get funding through their HR departments because these are University of California courses and um, you know they are you know usually funded by either department or company-wide HR and that is definitely something that uh, you should consider. Okay, the last one, if nothing else works, there's always loan programs. Uh, these are not terribly expensive undergraduate degrees, so uh, we work with uh, Wells Fargo and Sally May, so you can utilize those options as well. Okay, I wanna come back, because I wanna remind everybody, if you happen to need to drop off, because we're nearing our one hour time, 
Yeah. We do have the, uh, uh, one of the questions was, is the, the, the slides available to everybody? And yes, of course, uh, you will get a, uh, a, a link back to the webinar itself with all the recorded comments. Um, so uh, don't, don't worry about that. You can slide back forward and find our address or our phone numbers or whatever you need. Uh, again, we're certainly here to help, help you guys. Uh, I do want to scroll through a few of the questions here, and I appreciate, uh, uh, what was it, Oksana? Oksana is actually in the program right now, if you scroll down under the Q&A, and she's giving us some credit here, and that's awesome, I appreciate that. She says, it's her first semester, and I love it, the flexibility of the course format and the interactions with the classmates are great. The one thing I wanted to note is, interaction with your classmates is very important. Uh, you, you interact all week long on discussions and topics, but you also can, can find out about somebody and realize, oh, uh, you, you know, find out that somebody worked at, I don't know, Edwards Life Sciences or some company that you've heard of. And then maybe you go, oh, you live in Orange County, because everybody introduces themselves at the beginning of a course. One of the things I'd recommend that you do is you say, hey, Jill, I see that you work at... Uh, uh, Edwards Life Sciences, and you're here in Orange County. Can I go buy you a Subway sandwich sometime and you tell me what it's like working there? These are very simple but very valuable things to do within a class because many of your classmates are going to be employed in the industry. Others are going to be like you who are going to be looking for jobs. You want to form a team uh, to help each other out, not just in the class but after the class because your, one of your teammates or classmates may get a job somewhere and, and you might not have ever heard of that company, and you reach out to them and say, hey, i got this job over here, and they're hiring, and it's a great company. That's the power of networking. So please utilize that. Use it within your uh, uh, courses, with the times you go out to your industry society events. Uh, it is incredibly useful. Okay, uh, Michaela was asking about is it difficult for somebody with a background in food regulatory to transition to medical or pharma, and, and do companies want uh, uh, employees to have background in life sciences? And, and I'm going to let Sarah and Al ask a little, uh, answer a little bit of that question. I'm going to say in general, you know, a lot of the people do have some kind of bio or, or chem background, but a lot of them don't as well. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is not an absolute because a lot of times they might need somebody that just has a certain set of experiences. And a lot of times, again, they're hiring on general skills, your personality, your ability to manage projects. And uh, if you've had some experience in, in food, uh, that could be valuable, especially in a pharma side. But uh, Al, or, uh, let's start with Al. Al, your thoughts on uh, transitioning into uh, um, regulatory or compliance with a food background? Uh, sure. Um, no, I think that's fine. If you have a food background, then you can apply some of the same basic principles directly into the pharma pharmaceutical and medical device field. So I, I think that that's not an issue. Uh, I would even go so far as to say that if you really look at it, there's a lot of paperwork associated with regulatory affairs, for instance. Uh, therefore, if you have good skills as far as writing is concerned, it doesn't necessarily have to be technical writing, but you have good communication skills on paper, uh, once again, um, that kind of a person can uh, avail themselves of the opportunities in regulatory affairs. I would say that it doesn't hurt to have some technical background, certainly, but you certainly have more than enough opportunity uh, with whatever skill sets that you can bring. Uh, it's, it's just that uh, so much vastness to it, to it that, that it's important. It could, you could be, for instance, um, a, a, um, somebody who is in the marketing field and then looking at and understanding what the labeling, labeling requirements are or are not gives you a kind of a segue from your marketing background into regulatory affairs. So there's many, many, many angles that come into play here. And uh, just because you're not particularly technical uh, is not going to be uh, an issue in the long term. Sarah, your thoughts? I mean, you've seen a lot of people go through that, that may not have a, a technical background. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, same thing as, as I was saying, um, and it, it, you can. There are many angles um, uh, that you can apply. Uh, you know, some of the same things that you may do in your current position to the field of regulatory. Um, so there are some things you know that may overlap. Um, same with I saw another question about you know having five years of manufacturing um, ex engineer with five years of manufacturing experience. Um, that too, uh, you know, you would, of course, you know, be suitable for taking this course as well. Um, there's always, you know, different angles, as I was mentioning, that can be applied uh, to, you know, specific regulatory affairs uh, positions. Just, you know, go through the job descriptions if you come across an entry level position that, you know, you're interested in. Go through those job description bullet points and see. What are some things that you know relate to some of the things that you have already completed at your current or last position, or even in um, uh, some of the coursework uh, that you have done? You know, especially going through this regulatory certificate program. Something else um, I did was, uh, you know, just to get in the door, I would include that on the classes that I had completed on my resume and list, you know, different topics or different projects that I completed that. Um, although school related could be, you know, definitely applied to industry. Um, so using that as that is another way, like, you know, to get your foot in the door and using those as talking points uh, really helped me as well. Yeah, and I just add that, you know, we have seen lots of different people come through, and uh, just as Sarah and Al had mentioned, we have seen people come through that started on the production line that did not even have a college degree. But got in and learned, you know, not not from the engineering side, which a couple of our uh, people on the uh, uh, on the webinar now have, but just started on the blue collar side and slowly worked themselves up into management slots, and then started taking some courses and you know moved up onto the onto the regulatory or the compliance side. So uh, you, you know any of the the backgrounds and and uh, uh, Layla had a similar question about process in, in, in oil and gas, right? Well, it's the similar kind of things. You know, you, you understand a process, you understand pr uh, products, uh, you understand how to move them through the market. You know, there's politics, there's still, you know, regulatory issues uh, in oil and gas, you know, different, different, but the process of dealing with them uh, is, is, is similar. Uh, we would recommend, though, uh, for, for most of you guys who are transitioning, to, to take that first course, to talk to other people in the industry, to get out the same stuff, to get out to these industry society meetings. Uh, but, I, you know, I just, people's backgrounds, uh, all the ones that we've mentioned at the, on the phone here uh, are very well suited to just with a little bit of a change in their uh, in their backgrounds by uh, you know a course or two, and a, and a little bit more plugging into this particular network, um, you know you're going to be able to uh, get in here again if you want to. So half of the other battle is figuring out is this the industry for you, and taking classes, uh, and getting out to those industry society meetings is a great way to do both of those things. Again, at, from from our desks. We've seen a just wide, wide variety of people in wide walks of life and backgrounds and degrees uh, move through the program and move up uh, in, in industry and in their careers. So now we are just about out of time, so I just want to remind you of a couple things. One, if there's other questions that come up, please, you know, scroll back through the slides, find especially Jennifer's uh, uh, number. Uh, she is so good. She's answered these questions for years and years. Uh, uh, and has got a lot of resources at her fingertips. Uh, if you are interested in taking classes next next quarter, uh, there there are several really good ones. Both Al and Sarah. Sarah talked to you a little bit about her class, a very good class. You already know her a little bit. You can get a sense of it. Uh, so please, you know, start out. Try a class uh, if if you're interested. Chat chat with us before that. Um, and with that, I just like to say thank you so much uh, to Al and to Sarah for uh, being on with us. We appreciate everything you guys have done for us, not only advising our program, but teaching and, and, and just being a, a wonderful part of our advisory boards and, and helping make this program even better. And thank you to all of you guys for hanging out with us for, 
for an hour or so here. I know for many of you on the West Coast, it was lunch hour time, so we appreciate that. And with that, just wanted to say have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks again, Sarah. Thanks again, Al. Thanks for having us. You're, wel you're welcome. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Bye now. Bye.